no, I've got it. <laughs> wow, awesome, awesome worship today. And uh, I, I love the theme. Uh, my theme's the love of God today. And uh, this morning, Patty and I uh, woke up and we were getting ready and uh, we were worshiping. And a song came to our hearts. We began to sing just a song uh, out of our hearts uh, to Jesus and just began to thank him. And we began to sing his love from the beginning, his love never ending, the wonder of your love. And we just kind of stayed in that theme for quite a while this morning before we came in. And it's all about the love of Jesus, isn't it? That's why we're here. We're here because God so loved us that he gave his only son for us that if we choose to believe in him, we'll get receive a gift. And the gift that we receive is the gift of eternal life. That's a pretty good deal. It's a pretty good deal. And it's a great deal. So we're going to be talking a little bit today about the love of God, talking about perspective and uh, this whole thing of context. Uh, sometimes when the Lord speaks to me, he speaks to me with a word. He'll give me a word to speak. And, or not to speak, but to think about. So I'll think about it for a while and uh, until he uh, kind of lets me move on to something else. But I've been really thinking a lot about context, a lot about perspective, and more importantly, what I've been thinking about a lot is the whole context of biblical thinking. Context of biblical thinking, having our minds renewed by the Holy Spirit. And the way that that happens is through thinking the way that God thinks. So how do we know uh, how God thinks? Well, we find out in his, in his Word, that as we read His Word, we begin to see how God thinks about things, and then guess what happens? We begin to develop His thinking, we begin to begin to think like God thinks, and we begin to have a heaven-to-earth perspective. That's good news, and uh, especially when we're walking through trials and difficulties. Uh, can I see the hands of those who've ever walked through a trial or a difficulty? Uh, you're all inclusive. Some of us are, are liars because our hand to go up, but that's right. <laughs> but uh, trials and difficulties uh, are certainly what we all go through. So I just want to mention that we had a great team. There's a picture up here of our team that uh, this next picture that, that helped us pack it. Isn't that a mighty packing team? And they just they did a lot of that. And the teens uh, packed like 400 packs of Hershey Kisses and c candy in little, little bags. And uh, th we had a really great team. Had a lot of fun putting flowers out. And yes, we did go out and give away roses. Uh, we, our team, three guys, you know, three guys, uh, uh, Jeff, Steve, and I, we went out. And we went to U.S. Bank first. And we walk in. I walk in with the, with the roses. And and the lady comes out and says, hey, we're here to give you a hug. And she goes, oh, I really needed a hug today. And I said, well, let's go for it, you know. So we had a big old hug. And then she took the flowers over and gave it to the ladies. And I, we said, okay, group hug. And they all went like this. We all did a group hug. And uh, we did that several different places. We went to the veterinary, the veterinary hospital, where there's just a bunch of workers. I think they had 12 workers that day. Same response, you know, we gave the flowers and said, hey, we're from the upper room, just want to let you know that God loves you, and we we're just off, we want to give you a big hug today for Valentine's, and again, we got another group hug uh, from, from them, so that was really a lot of fun, and one of the reasons why we, we do this kind of stuff is, is because it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance, and, uh, and most, most people who come to Jesus, uh, they come because of the goodness of God. Uh, because of his love for them, and they, when they begin to realize how much God loves them, then what, they, what else can you do but give your heart to Jesus? That's what happened to me. I had, uh, back in my life, back in my days of drug abuse and all that kind of stuff, when Jesus broke into my car as I'm driving down the road, when I crawled out, God help me, his presence so filled the car that I knew at that moment everything was going to be okay. Do you know what that present, presence I felt? That was God's love. And the reason why I say it's, it's God's love is because that is who God is. He is the essence of love. He is love. He doesn't just love. He is love. That's who he is. He can't do anything else but love because he is love. And that's uh, the, his essence. And that's what we sense when we <coughs> excuse me, talk about, about, uh, about uh, God's love and expressing God's love out into our community. I was in 
Pensacola, excuse me for my throat, it's a little bit scratchy today. But I was in Pensacola uh, during the Brownsville revival. Anybody remember Brownsville? Anybody so old, old enough to remember that? But uh, I was down there, I just came back from Scotland. My wife and I were, were missionaries in Scotland for 18 years. Just came back transitioning into a church called Liberty Church. Uh, the church was in decline. It was uh, had uh, what used to be like 15 to 2,000 people. When I got there, it was 150 people. And uh, we were still meeting in the building that, set, that was built for 1,500 people. So can you imagine our wonderful worship services with 150 chairs out front in this whole big space? It was pretty crazy. And so they asked, asked me to really to help uh, shift the church to begin to do outreach because they had done no outreach. It had declined. And uh, nothing was really happening from the church. Except, and the only people that remained were the faithful uh, older people uh, and a uh, sprinkling of a few married couples. And, but they had a huge, for some reason, they had a huge teen group, young adult teen group, which was a part, part of it was uh, uh, led by the pastor's son, Josh Liscombe, who's now the senior pastor of Liberty Church. Well, we began to go out into the community and just love on the community uh, just by doing acts of kindness. And more than once, I would go out and we, we do acts of kindness and talk to people about Jesus and, and just give them a can of Coke with a little card on it. And, and uh, people would respond to that and talk to us. And then what happened, people began to get excited about it, like the teens did, and so they began to go out. Well, what happened was when Buford Lipscomb came to that church to rebuild the church, he was like a master... Uh, rebuilder. He could take anything that was broken in it and make it whole. And so they embraced this whole thing of kindness outreach. They began to really, really go for it. After I left, I didn't know this until a few years ago, but they really just really caught what I had brought for 18 months. And they just really did it over and over and over again. Went out in the community, loved on people. They fed people. They created all these kinds of venues for, for uh, created a retreat for women who uh, were abused and beat up and people, prostitutes and stuff like that. They had a whole house that was created for, for them. And now they're in six locations and they just rebuilt their, their building that seats now, I think about 1,500 people. And the first day they opened up after the pandemic, or not after pandemic, but about two months ago, they couldn't get enough people so they immediately had to go to two services because they had so many people show up. That's amazing. And that's not, an, that's not bragging on what I, I did, but it, it's, it, I'm trying to explain, explain this. And when you begin to go out into the community and to show God's love, the only way they can see and know God's love is if we as believers can experience God's love and receive it and then to give away the very love that we've received out into the community. Does that make sense? Does that make sense to you guys? So that's why we do that. An interesting story uh, when I was there, I, I love this story, the, the worship leader who's now one of the worship leaders at uh, Liberty, but when he was younger, him and Josh, Josh is now the pastor, and Matt was, is the worship leader, kind of partners in crime, grew up together in the church. So Matt had been talking to a young couple about Jesus. He'd been talking to them, he'd spent time with them, they had him over uh, for dinner, uh, talked to him about how raising kids, how to raise family, and all this kind of stuff. And then one, one night, uh, they were downtown Pensacola, and uh, they had a flat tire. And when they're sitting in the car in, in the flat tire, and all of a sudden, these two young revival students <laughs> come up to the car, and they, they say, hey, uh, we see you had a flat tire. And the guy in the car goes, yeah, we had a flat tire. And he says, uh, can I ask you a question? And the guy goes, sure, ask me a question. <laughs> And get the scenario. How do you feel after you've just had a flat tire? You've got tired kids in the back. You know, you know you're going to have to get out of your car. You're going to have to change the, the tire get to get dirty to get home. So anyway, the rival the students said to him, let me ask you a question. Can I ask you this question? He says, okay, man, ask me the question. He said, the student said, do you see that telephone pole? He says, yeah, I see that telephone pole. He said, the student said, well, if you and your family had smashed into a telephone pole and had died, would you have gone to heaven or gone to hell? <laughs> Witnessing 101, not. <laughs> so what happened was this antagonistic conversation began. 
And so how uh, I found out about the story was Matt, who was their friend, trying to bring them to Jesus through love and care and concern for the family, had, some, had to do some damage repair. Would you, can you believe that? They had, he had to do some repair on who these guys were. Well, anyway, fast forward the story about, about a month later, we're out at, out at a street light, and we have all kinds of coolers with all kinds of drinks, and people would pull up to street light, and we'd say, hey, you want a Diet Coke, Coke, or a bottle of water? And they'd say, we'd like to have a bottle of water, and we'd give them a bottle of water. Here's a Connect card just showing you God's love in a practical way. Uh, 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 we, some people say, hey, we get, want a Coke. So we give them a Coke and put a card and say, hey, we're just showing you God's love in a practical way, and then they'd read the card. Well, what happened was this couple received one of those bottles of water and a Coke at a street light. And our people were really friendly and happy and just really just trying to share the love of God, the love of Christ. And so they began, Matt uh, found out about this because the next meeting they had with this couple, they uh, had been dialoguing about the first encounter with Christians, and now they're having another conversation, encounter about these Christians. And so they asked the questions. They said this, what's different about you? You guys are so different than what we encountered. And let me just say this. This doesn't reflect that first story, all revival students, okay? I'm just saying that. It doesn't, okay? And so if you're a revival person, don't get mad at me and write me emails. And if you do, my email is Aaron Simmons at <laughs> Upper Room, Ohio, okay? I'm not saying that. You know, there's, there's a new generation. They figured it out a lot better than that generation. You have to remember, we were, this was in like, you know, a long, 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 long time ago. I'm really old, okay? So that was really a long time ago. So just want to just make sure I'm standing and I'm not going to be stoned by people. Anyway, so uh, they asked the question, what was the difference in, between what they were doing and what you were doing? And so Matt said this. He says, what we're trying to do is represent represent Jesus to our world through serving because Jesus came as a servant and so what we feel like we can do to serve our community is to get engaged in the community love people where they are even when they're driving on a hot day they can receive a coke and a bottle of water you know what the couple said oh that makes total sense that makes total sense and so that's part of the reasons why we do this kind of stuff is, is really to help uh, reach out and to reach out to people and just to say, hey, we love you in a small little practical way. And I, I can't tell you how many people that uh, I've, I've encountered that uh, have met Jesus because someone loved them enough just to serve them. And uh, then I find out about, about the story. Well, I want to talk uh, also when we leave today, there's a kindness to go. When you leave today, there's some uh, Hershey Kisses stuff out there. Grab a whole bunch. There's some flowers out there. And tomorrow's Valentine's Day. When you go to work, hey, take some of those into, into work. If you have kids, give some flowers uh, to your kids to take to the teachers at school. Uh, tomorrow morning, uh, we'll be at all seven schools in Tip City to take uh, uh, nice things to the teachers just to celebrate uh, Valentine's Day. And it's so interesting that, that uh, what happens when you begin to sow deeds of kindness, especially in a small rural community, when you sow deeds of kindness in a small uh, rural community, it's like a pebble going into a pond and the ripple effects just keep going and going and going because everybody hears about that. Is that okay? Kind of a good explanation? The kind of why we do this. I want to talk a little bit about, very quickly, about context and a perspective, and talk a little bit about God's love and our perspective, uh, especially when we when we go through trials. And the context of our lives could be financial, could be relational, could be emotional. It uh, could be uh, what's going on with us at work, and it also can be physical and spiritual, depending on where we are in all of those, you know, financially, emotional, uh, relational, spiritual, and physical, uh, what can happen to us, we can begin to uh, have a, uh, a perspective that sometimes is clouded by the things that we're going through. Does that make sense to you guys? 
Sometimes our perspective can get clouded by the things we go through. And so inspective, uh, perspective is, is really, really important. Uh, I have a, a glass of water up here. I'd like you to let, let me know. Uh, that glass is... Were there any half empties in the room? <laughs> and is there other people who are saying that glass is getting ready to slide off that counter? Is anybody that perceptive? Anybody that perceptive? You know, but uh, it's certainly true. You know, it's true. And uh, I am wired to be a, a glass uh, half empty person. That's the way I'm wired. I'm wired to see issues and stuff like that, and and then I have to pull back and then I have to say well how can I get encouragement good person to go to is Josh Haas or to go to Aaron, uh, Aaron Simmons that, for Aaron Simmons that glass is opportunities of filling it up to overflowing <laughs> that's, uh, that's the way Aaron is, is wired so it's really important and it is, it's really important too that when we're going through stuff that we do have uh, a biblical context that we understand uh, with the Bible, why it was written, so that we can have a, a, a good kingdom foundation and to be able to have a good perspective when we were going through stuff. And so it's important that when we read the Bible, when we read the Bible, that we do read the Bible. There's a recent uh, Facebook post said like 26% of uh, believing Christians uh, read, their, read their Bible occasionally or something like that. That's all that do. And so it's really important for us to, to uh, get into God's Word and make sure we're reading, reading His Word because it's His Word that helps us to bring to us a biblical perspective on what's going on in our lives and also into the world. And it's also to under, uh, really important to understand the context in which the Bible was written. Uh, for, for example, I've been really meditating on through the book of John, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and Revelation. That's John. He wrote all that. John wrote all that stuff. And some scholars say it wasn't John that wrote uh, uh, the book of John. But there's other scholars say, yes, he did. But uh, I've been really digging into uh, getting into uh, biblical context and perspective. And Patty, Patty's the theologian in, in my house. She's the theologian. She's the one who calls people out on their stupid stuff. When they, when, they, when they do preaching and it's totally out of context and totally uh, irrelevant for what the writer of the book was trying to say. It's important to understand what the writer was trying to say so that it can fit into our context so we can understand uh, what the writer was saying. And so here's, here's some things you might write, that, write, write this down. Who, who is the writer writing to? Who is the writer writing to? Who is the writer what was his background? What was his history? It gives us confidence to be able to read his, his, his word. Well, well, John was one of the disciples. John was, they say, was a young man. He was either a teenager in his early 20s when he began to follow Jesus. He was also, get this, he was also called the, one of the sons of thunder. Can you, isn't that cool? You know why he was called one of the sons of thunder, him and James? Because they wanted a new city. They wanted to nuke a city. Yes. They had this, they kind of had an attitude, you know, if people don't receive us, we'll just nuke them, <laughs> you know. And Jesus had to say, hey guys, hey guys, uh, you don't know what spirit you're speaking from. But there were young ze zealots. They were, they were zealous for Jesus. And John was one of the three that were closest to Jesus. There was John, uh, there was Peter, and there was James. And John was the closest. He was the one that Jesus really poured into and my question when I began to, to look at all this, what, what moved uh, John in his 20s to be a wise, loving man later on in life, 46 years later, about when he wrote the book of John, and then his later years in his life, in his 80s, there's still hope for me, in his 80s and 90s, he wrote 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and Revelation. What moved him from being this person, fiery young guy, to be the apostle of love? It's said of John that when he would come into town, uh, people that knew John, uh, like, it would be like Aaron Simmons going somewhere speaking. And whenever uh, John was going to come into town to speak at the church, because he's really old, they carry him on, on a pallet and they go walking into town and they lay, lay John down at the, at the meeting. He'd be, be sitting there and his sermons were really short. 
They say that one of his most favorite sermons was this. Beloved, let us love one another. Shut the book. They pick him up and they take off. But because he was the apostle of love and because he had demonstrated love when he said that, because he lived that, there was power. There was power. So it's understanding who who John is and uh, understanding who he's writing to, what was going on, uh, why did they write it. Uh, And then here's a really good question. If you want to think about this, this is the really key question. How does this apply to my life today? As we're reading through the Bible, I would encourage you to begin to read through the Bible and and to understand uh, the context in which we live and the context in which uh, the Bible is written. Here's why uh, John wrote the book of John. So we'll just put this up here. Here's why John wrote it. John wrote wrote it for this. Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. But these, what are the these? They're the signs and wonders. Seven mentioned in the book of John. Seven I am's, seven miracles in the book of John. But these, these miracles have been written for purpose. Here's his purpose for writing. So that, and I wanna, I wanna, write, I wanna write three books, okay? One of the books is gonna be the butts in the Bible. And the other one was going to be the so that's in the Bible and then the therefores in the Bible. That would be really a, a great book to read. Probably not for you guys, but it would be really, really fun. So that, here's the purpose, so that you may believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. That's why he wrote. That is the crux of why he wrote the book of John, was so that we might believe. And believing in Jesus, we might have life in his name. That was his lifelong message. That was his desire. When he wrote 1 John years and years and years later, the purpose of him writing that book was the same purpose, so that you may know Jesus Christ and knowing him that you may know that you have eternal life. He didn't change from, the, from his first book all the way through to his second book and to the revelation of who Jesus was when he wrote Revelation. So it's very important uh, to have a good perspective. And so how, how do we improve our perspective? How do we uh, begin to improve our context in, in, as we read the Bible? And how, how, do, how do we do this? And uh, two, two ways is, is by renewing our mind, which I talked to you at the beginning, by the renewing of our mind in the spirit of our minds through reading the word, through worship, and, and uh, paying attention to our lives and listening to what God is saying, trying to get his perspective on a situation. That's how we renew our minds. There's no shortcuts. If you want to have a renewed mind, you have to do something to help your mind to shift the way that God thinks. The best way of shifting the way that God thinks is to begin to read the Bible, investigating what God thinks about a situation, circumstance, or matter. To young people, we would say this, flee youthful lust. You know, we all hear that, flee youthful lust. But there's, there's also another connection to that for young people. It says, along with those who pursue love from a pure heart. So that connection, man, if you're struggling in purity in your heart, guess what? Find somebody that you can pursue love, faith, and hope, and purity with. And that will help you not just to flee the stuff, but it'll give you purpose and a relational, relational connection to help you to move into what God has for you. That makes sense? I think it makes sense. So it's renewing our minds. So three things happen when we, re, we uh, renew our minds. We begin to get heaven's perspective. And heaven's perspective is found on three basic words. Heaven's perspective is found on love, hope, and faith. That's heaven's perspective on everything. Love, why? Because God is love. He is love. And we realize how much God loves us. Guess what happens to our heart? we begin to get hope in our hearts that we are loved. And then what happens? Our faith grows. We can begin to believe again because we know we've experienced the love that God has for us found through His Son, Jesus. And those are three really key words, faith, hope, and love. And uh, when uh, we understand that we are loved, hope comes to our heart 
and faith is ignited. Well, the Bible is his story. Uh, next slide. The Bible is his story. And uh, reading the Bible from the viewpoint of context and seeking to understand his perspective. And so uh, Paul's writing this, and, and in my Bible college, they required us to memorize Romans 8. That was that important. They said, you guys need to memorize Romans 8, everything in it, because it's that important you need to, to remember it. And I can remember most of it now, just because of all the years I've, I've memorized and gone over it. But the key uh, verse uh, in this whole uh, writing, of, of especially toward the end of Romans 8, is this, if God is for us, who can be against us? See, that's heaven's perspective. If God is for us, who can be against us? And then Paul begins to go through and to unpack that one statement that God is love and he loves us. And he goes on to say this, he loves us and nothing can separate us from his love. He goes on to say, who will separate us from the love of God, the love of Christ? Then he lists, it's interesting, he says this, who will separate us? And then he lists the who. Here are the who. Will tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword? That's who. And it's interesting, if you look at those words, all this comes from people. Tribulation comes from people. Distress comes from people. Persecution comes from people. Famine comes from people. Uh, it's bad stuff that they do, different things. They're not sharing all that stuff. Also, nakedness, peril, or sword, most of that comes from people. When, they, when Paul was writing this, he lived this. This wasn't just a saying. He lived this. He lived nakedness. He lived peril. He lived sword. He lived persecution. He lived uh, distress. But he kept on going. In Romans 8.37, let's get that up there, it says this, But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him, who does what? Loves us. We conquer by understanding that God loves us. He loves us personally. Then he goes on to say, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Isn't that amazing? You can find anything in that list. Anything that you're going through in that list will not separate you from the love of God. Never separate you from the love of God. And so Paul asks again, what can separate us from the love of God? Do you know what his, the answer is? Nothing. Could you all say that with me? Yeah. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Understanding his hope, uh, his love, again, brings hope and ignites faith. And I think what happens, what happens to us a lot of times when we're going through stuff, it's kind of like this picture when we're going through stuff. Uh, we could be storm-tossed. Uh, the next slide, if you get We could be storm-tossed. Has anybody ever experienced any storm where you've been storm-tossed? And I know I had a major blowout in my life. I was totally burned out uh, five years ago. And that's why I began to come here, because I, was, I had a total blowout. Uh, I didn't even know if God loved me. I didn't know if I loved me. I mean, y yesterday was really interesting, just a sidebar. Yesterday, it was interesting. I went to a place a lot of people here go to and took some flowers in. And there was a lady there. And her response to me giving the flowers was this. And I've never had this question or statement uh, uh, thrown at me. She goes, she goes, wow, you must really love yourself. And I went, I went, wow. I said, uh, I just turned 70. And I'm trying to figure that one out. <laughs> but I thought, I never had that question. Wow, you must really love yourself to be able to come and to be able to give love to others. I, I never had thought about that because the reason why I go and do what I do is because Jesus loves me and I want them to love, you know, to love them. So anyway, it was a, that was interesting. But what happens is, I think what happens is when we, when we start going through stuff, what happens is we zoom in. We zoom in. And so we're in our boat and we're being storm tossed and our perspective is whatever's going on in our life. 
And what we need to do, and if we can remember to do it, it's a tip, what we need to do is we need to uh, make a, a perspective and context change. That means may mean go outside and go for a walk. <laughs> and uh, recently we were in Albuquerque and, and I was with my son, we are out for a walk, and so we're having this really good father-son you know, conversation, and then all of a sudden, he threw, he threw a, a fastball that really got me emotionally upset. And so I thought, I got to get out of this situation because I don't want to say anything uh, that's going to affect my, my son's relationship right here because if I say what I want to say, it ain't going to be good. So I just said, I'm going to walk faster. I'll see you in a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I just put pedal to the metal and took off, took off and walked faster, started calming everything down. And by the time, time we met back up, it gave him space to think about what he said, gave me space to calm down, and it was over. It wasn't, what didn't turn out to, to be a, a big deal. But So what, what we tend to do is we, we zoom in, uh, the, and to be honest, it's to natural tendency so when you're going through stuff, what I would encourage you to do is to zoom out because you might see something a little bit different. Here's the rest of the picture. You might see something a little bit different. And what you might see is an understanding that when Jesus saw these guys, he saw them from a long way off. Have you ever felt like Jesus is a long way off? Well, your perspective might need to shift to believe that even though you sense him walking a, a long way off, that he sees you and he is now walking towards you in the midst of your storm, in the midst of your wa waves, in the midst of what's going on in your life. Because that's the kind of Jesus we serve. We serve a Jesus who's acquainted with grief and sorrow. He understands and he's a Jesus that when we're going through difficulties and, and times of difficulty, that he wants us to know that we're loved. That's what the theme of today. You all picking up on the theme today? That, that we are loved. We are loved by God. We are precious to him. And guess what? Nothing, nothing, nothing can separate us from his love. Do you agree? Amen. So, that's a little message. And so I'd like you to do an exercise right now. One of the things I'd like you to do is begin uh, to think about your story. Think about your story. If you've walked through anything, think about your story and how, not only just about your story, but how you came through your story. Think about that just for a minute. Think about, wow, yeah, I went through some stuff, but what, how did I come through? And, and what happened to my life? And then I would like you to do is begin to think about that story, and then I'd like what I'd like to do is to practice telling that story very briefly with another person in the room. So I'd encourage you just to pair up in twos, okay? Can you all do that? Just find a neighbor real quick, and believe me, this is going to be painless, and if you are not at a place where you uh, are not comfortable doing this, there's no pressure, you don't have to pair up with anybody. You don't have to, to, to do anything I'm asking you to do. But if you do, I would encourage you that when you hear the story of someone coming through, someone who had been there in their stuff, and when they came through and how Jesus brought them through, guess what happens to your heart? You get encouraged. And maybe you can believe, you know, if God did it for you, then guess what? He can do it for me. So would you do that? Just pair up and then here's, here's the questions. They'll be up here for about, just uh, for a few minutes. What was going on? What was going on in your storm tossed life? What was going on? How are you feeling? You know, if anybody asked me five years ago how I was feeling, I would say, I don't know what I would say. I probably had a few swear words that Christians aren't supposed to say. But anyway, what brought you to the point of resolution? Reconciliation, life change, better health, or situational change. What brought you through? What began to, to the point of it to help you to bring? And then describe how you've changed since you've received help or how your prayer was answered. 
How did God show up for you? That's basically it. So pair up and go for it. And we're only going to do this for like four minutes, okay? So one person has two minutes, the other person has two minutes. Okay, it's time to switch. Okay, it's time to switch to switch partners. I like when I read the Bible, this would be a tip. Uh, 
is I like to buy these little booklets. This one has Hebrews and James, and it says faith works. And so this encourages me to be able to read the Bible in little chunks, because when I pick up a really big book, for me somehow it flips me out. Like I can't, can't get my head around, I can just read like a little book. And so what I do is I buy these, I have a stack of them. And inside of it, I write notes. So there's all kinds of little notes, scribbles and stuff. And so I want to read one of them that, uh, that we're just to, just to encourage you. Jesus, our compassionate King Priest. So then we must cling to faith with everything we know to be true. For we have a magnificent King Priest, Jesus Christ, the Son of God who rose into the heavenly realm for us and now sympathizes with us in our frailty. That's our Jesus. He sympathizes with us. He understands humanity. For as a man, our magnificent king priest was tempted in every way just as we are and conquered sin. So now we come freely and boldly to where love is enthroned to receive mercy's kiss. Anybody need a kiss of mercy today? I need a kiss of mercy every day. And discover the grace we urgently need to strengthen us in our times of weakness. See how that's applicable to every situation. The Bible in context is really important for us as believers to begin to read so that we can begin to change our thinking to get a different perspective on what's going on in our life so that we can be those people that Jesus called us to be so that we can give away, this is the whole part of going, is that we give away what we receive. That's the true, true life of a true Christian is we receive and then we give away to our family, to our friends, our brothers and sisters, and not only brothers and sisters, but to the world so that they might believe. Uh, I wrote a book and I did a, a revis, re, revision of it. And, and I'm always, I, don't, I really don't like people who do this on TV, but I, I have a, a curveball, okay? So you ready for the curveball? I have, I think, like 13, 14 copies. I turned 70 and on Amazon.com, I gave away this book for a week. If anybody wanted it, they could go on Amazon.com and get it for free. There's 17 copies out at the info uh, center, and if you'd like a copy, you, know, you can you can have it. And then, lastly, let's stand. Let's just stand. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna step out here a little bit. I want to sing. Okay. Okay. Yes, love from the beginning. Your love never. difficulties a long way off and we thank you that you come walking on the very waves and the wind of our issues or our trauma our difficulties and we thank you Jesus that when you get in the boat with us and we receive you in the boat instantly it says the disciples are translated to safe harbor and safe land and so Lord today we invite you into our boat. Would you just whisper that, Jesus, just come into my boat. And today, if you don't know Jesus, if you've never made a commitment to him, if you've never said, Jesus, I need you in my life, come into my life. He promises that he'll come into your life. The book of John and 1 John says, if you receive him, as many as received him, he gave them the right to be called sons and daughters of God. And 
And he's a gentleman, so he won't push himself upon you. But what he will do, he'll stand at the door of your heart. And he'll knock and he'll say, if you open up, I'll come in. That's the gentleman that Jesus is. If you open up your heart, then he will come in. And he will impart eternal life to you. So today, if you've never made a commitment to Jesus, you've never said, Jesus, come, get into my boat, get into my mess. And guess what? Jesus, so Jesus understands the mess. And he's able to get into your boat, into your life, to turn your life around. So if that's you today and you've never um, asked Jesus in your life, I'd encourage you. There'll be some people up here just now. The prayer team will be up here. They'll pray with you. If you're going through some stuff and you're saying, you know, Steve, you just stirred it up. Today, you just kind of stirred up what I was going through. And you need more prayer. Well, there'll be The prayer team will be up here to pray with you. And before you go, don't forget to grab some, I mean, seriously, grab a couple of handfuls of, of our kindness to go. Grab a few flowers and go out and uh, bless the community. God bless you guys. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.